Gethin, thank you for talking to me. Can you tell us a little bit about your life before your involvement with lesbian and gay support the minors? Ooh, well, I was in my early 30s in 1984, so um, I grew up originally in North Wales, um, in Hollyhead. My father was a, a fireman and a trade union activist. Um, and my mother was from a, um, a family who, who were mainly um, slate quarry men. So I grew up between Hollyhead and Bethesda, which is a slate quarrying village. Um, and then in my teens, I moved to South East England and eventually to London. Um, and then at 23, I went to university in Leeds, where I was involved in the kind of tail end of what was Leeds GLF. Mm. Um, it, I think Gay Liberation Front hung on longer in Leeds than anywhere else, so there was still a group calling itself Leeds GLF in, in, in the early 70s. But I got involved there really in stuff from that point on. I'd done a bit before I'd been involved in mm. the campaign around getting WH Smith to stop gay news, for instance, um, picketing WH Smith's branches and such like. But um, really, my kind of activism started as a student, slightly a mature student, 23, mm. was involved in setting up Gay Switchboard in Leeds. Um, and then a whole range of things onwards from there, really. At what stage did you move to London? Um, I kind of spent part of my time in London from, from my late teens and, and then actually I moved here permanently after I finished university in Leeds. So I've been here since 1981 now, pretty much solidly. Can you tell us a bit of the background to lesbian and gay support the minors? Um, well, as I remember it, pretty much everybody who was involved in Lesbian Gay Support Minors had started off supporting the minors in some other way. So basically we were a group of young, youngish um, trade union activists, Labour Party activists, Communist Party activists, obviously Marcus, Gen Sec um, of the Young Communist League, mm -hmm. other people involved in various other uh, lefty groups. Mm -hmm. Um, and most of us were trade unionists and certainly for myself I'd been involved um, in collecting for Tower Colliery with um, Lewisham Labour Party and I'd been involved through my trade union uh, in collecting for a colliery in Yorkshire and I was working actually at the time at the London School of Economics so the, the London School of Economics uh, student union were turned through an event and actually once LGSM got going the um, Gay Sock uh, LSE mm -hmm. um, started raising funds for a pit in, in Scotland. Um, so I think most people had a similar kind of starting that they had started off because LGSM was just a tiny part of what was really a, a mass movement um, of support. I mean, there's so many people, I think, even people who weren't politically involved were just repelled by the idea of whole communities being starved back to work. Um, and the things that the government were doing in terms of um, sequestrating union funds, that there no uh, strike pay could be paid because all the union funds have been frozen, uh, specifically changing the social security legislation to prevent uh, minors' wives and children who would otherwise have been eligible mm. to prevent them from, from getting any um, state benefits. Um, and it was a very, very clear attempt to, to starve people back into, mm -hmm. into work. Uh, and people just reacted against that and we were, we were part of that. Mark Ashton you mentioned briefly, he died in 1987. What was he like as a person? He was extremely charismatic um, and I think his real genius was just making activism fun. Um, you know, you, you couldn't spend five minutes without him before you were laughing and uh, usually laughing hysterically. Um, he was very, very funny, very committed, um, and very focused. I think he, one of the reasons LGSM worked quite well, even though it had a really disparate group of lefties mm -hmm. who would normally be rowing about this, that and everything, um, was that Mark set the tone by saying, right, this is not about politics, this is about raising money. We're not interested, we're not discussing At our meetings, we don't discuss the politics of the, the strike. We don't discuss the politics of anything. Mm. We simply organise who's going to go out and collect where. We count the money, we get it down to Wales as quickly as we can. 
Um, and it just gave a very, very narrow focus, which enabled us to, to actually work well. And of course, we, socially, we, would get, we got on. A lot of us were people who already socialised together in the Bell in King's Cross. Mm -hmm. That was the kind of alternative lefty queer pub. Um, so we, a lot of us knew each other, socialised with each other anyway. And that kind of friendship networks kind of developed and grew. As part of raising money for the mining communities, you held a benefit concert, which was headlined by Vronsky Beat. That's right. What yes. do you remember about that concert? Um, <laughs> there were a group of half a dozen people who were actively involved in organising it. I wasn't one of the key organisers, but obviously on the night I was there and I was working, I was selling tickets, um, I was collecting litter, I was uh, working on the hat check. Um, but I remember it has been just incredibly, uh, incredibly packed for a start. I mean, I think we were thrilled with the numbers that turned up. Um, I remember Di Donovan's speech um, and uh, the version of the speech, which, you know, which appears in the film, is very much Di Donovan's words. It's taken from a video that we made at the time, All Out Dancing in Dull Ice. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, you know, that's virtually what he said. Um, so it was a really inspiring and moving speech. And I think the whole night and then we went off afterwards at some point like an hour in the morning drinking and carousing further um, and after that I don't remember a lot. You're depicted in the film played by Irish actor Andrew Scott. How accurate was your depiction? Not, it wasn't intended to be a recreation of me. Um, I think the key characters of Mark Ashton and Mike Jackson, they went very carefully to try to find somebody who would really bring that person back to life, who, well, in, in Mike's case, he's still here. But I mean, to really, you know, be that person. Mm -hmm. And if you close your eyes and listen to Joe Gilgan, you could be listening to Mike Jackson. Um, and they're physically similar. Um, and, so, and again, with Ben Schnetzer, I mean, he did an amazing job of, um, bringing Mark's character and mannerisms and ways of speaking and all of that stuff. So they were very, very, very much based on the real characters. I think the other characters tended to be there for specific reasons. Mm -hmm. So I think the Gethin character is very much intended to contrast with the Cliff character. Mm -hmm. So you have Cliff who is gay, stays within his community, retains his ties with his community um, at the cost of suppressing his gay life. And you have Gethin, who is also gay, but who leaves, who lives an openly gay life, but at the cost of losing some of that contact with his family and his community. And I think that's a story which resonates with all sorts of people from, you know, kind of country, you know, rural backgrounds or religious backgrounds or whatever. I think that's a choice that lots of gay men had to make in the past. Um, so the character was there for that particular purpose, and there were some aspects of it that were taken. So I, I didn't actually manage gay wood. I worked in a bookshop during this. Because you would have, well, the Gethin character was depicted as being the owner That's right, of yes. the word. Yeah, which was never the case. I mean, yeah. uh, I worked in a bookshop, so there was that kind of slack element, which then possibly triggered mm. students to think, oh, right, okay, well, let's merge that bookshop. And, and Gethin's character was also portrayed as being the boyfriend of Jonathan Blake, which That's wasn't the case yeah. either. No, no, Jonathan and Nigel were together at the time of the strike, and they're still together now. Um, so, uh, we've been friends for that period, but uh, no, we were we were never partners, and we never lived upstairs, and we never had that outrageous pig dildo. That all came from Stephen Beresford's imagination. <laughs> and that film, there's a wonderful scene in it, my favourite scene, where Jonathan Blake is dancing on the table at the disco to shame, shame, shame. Yeah. Did that scene ever take place? No, that's just, that's a scene which was again triggered by a real life thing in that um, one of the things which Stephen saw when he was preparing, you know, when he was researching the he was shown a photograph um, and it's a photograph of Jonathan on the dance floor at uh, Onslaught Miners Welfare surrounded by this group of women and some of us in the background. Um, so there's an element of it. I mean, most of the men in Delice, uh, in Yonkrin and Delice Valley in South Wales generally, I guess, mm -hmm. didn't really dance. I mean, some of the older men would waltz or foxtrot and kind of ballroom dancing, but all this kind of 
you know, getting up on the dance floor and dancing to disco music um, and moving their hips. It wasn't really something that Welsh miners did. So when we went down there, there was this sense that, you know, kind of, God, there are all these men who will dance now. I wasn't actually one of them because I don't dance, but <laughs> that's because I'm Welsh, I don't know. Um, so my only dancing experience at Onslow was actually dancing with um, John Heaton, very, very drunk, three or four in the morning, uh, waltzing with um, mm -hmm. Evina Heaton's husband, John, um, who was one, kind of one of these older people who were really into ballroom dancing, not normally with a man. <laughs> But anyway, so that, that kind of triggered, that photograph triggered this, this, um, this, this dance sequence. There's a very touching scene in the film, which I saw the film in Sydney, and it's when the Geffen character meets, I believe, his mother. Yeah. And they're reunited. Even talking about it with you now gets me tearful. Did you have a similar experience? No. <laughs> that, again, is it's part of the, character, part of the, the, the kind of... Um, part of the storyline that, that Stephen wanted to develop and the idea of, you know, making that choice between staying and leaving and what you gain and lose by those choices. Um, and I suspect that also he, I mean, I think one of the things about the film I, that I feel is that, you know, like I've, none of the characters is wholly bad. You know, he's, the, the film finds something good about pretty much everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you see the tensions between um, Bromley and his mother, mm -hmm. but at the same time you also see, you know, his mother expressing her love for him and this kind of explanation that her actions are actually triggered by genuine concern. She doesn't want him to be old and lonely and uh, having to live a secret life. So it's ignorance rather than nastiness, which is, you know, you know, motivating her. And I think, you know, again, that, that reconciliation, which is kind of hinted at, it's not, you know, because Gethin meets his mum at the door and then it fades away and he's back on his way back to, um, to South Wales. A, a, you know, a journey that wouldn't have actually been possible to thrill where the mythical Gethin came from. Um, I think because um, Andrew's makeup artist was from Trill. Oh. So he was spending an hour and a half talking to somebody with a real accent and they thought, oh, well, let's make him come from real because he's going to go on there talking with a real accent. Uh, it's not really a Bangor accent. So it's accent. part of getting you. I suppose in... Obviously, I was there. <laughs> so it's my name. I mean, some of the stuff that he did go down to, there collecting... Uh, working in a bookshop, um, being slightly older than the the most of people. Most of the people were five, six, seven years younger than me. So there were a few were sort of just that little bit older and perhaps been involved in some earlier stuff. Um, being a bit quieter and shy and reticent. As you can see, I'm a bit quiet and shy and reticent. <laughs> Far from it. Far well, I, from perhaps it. I was then. My mum certainly thinks I was. She thinks there's aspects of of me in the way in which it's portrayed. With because in the, the film, film you're kind of quite a contrast to the Jonathan Blake character. I mean, yes, he's yes. out and out there. You're very studious. You yes. love your books. Yeah, and I think that I mean, I think you know that is an element of um, mm. characterization of me, perhaps. Yeah. We mentioned Gaze the Word. How big a role did Gaze the Word actually play with regards to your organisation and meetings? Well, for a long time we did meet there. I mean, we grew quite quickly. We started off meeting, the first few meetings were actually in Mark's flat, and then we moved to a room at County Hall, um, the Greater London Council headquarters. Um, and I think they wanted to be paid or something, I don't know. But then we moved to Gage the Word. Um, we, we were there for a long time. We met every Tuesday night, I think, um, until we outgrew that space. Um, and then we moved to a room above a pub called The Fallen Angel in Islington, which no longer exists. So lots of the meetings took place there. And then of course, virtually every Saturday while we existed, we were outside Gaze the Word. Uh, there's a little strip of private land immediately outside Gaze the Word, you know, the, the glass lights which illuminate the basement downstairs. Uh, that's private land and the police couldn't move us from it, from there. Mm. Uh, so we weren't committing any offences by standing there rattling buckets. So it was a key place for us to be, it was safe. You can nip inside and have a cup of coffee. Um, 
So every Saturday we were a case of words. So obviously it was really important from that point of view. Stephen Beresford wrote the screenplay, the script. He has often talked in interviews about how he heard what he wasn't sure if it was an urban myth yeah. about this group of gay men yes. and lesbians who got together to support the miners. At what stage did he contact you and other members of the group? Um, it was about two years before the film, or even, even more than that, perhaps closer to three. Um, he basically been touting the, the story around and he eventually lost some money to develop a script and then realised that actually he didn't know that much about it and would need to find out more. Um, and he found that video that I referred to, All Out Dancing in Dallas, he found it on YouTube. Um, and he watched it through the end and then saw, saw the credits and he just looked for unusual names. Mm. Uh, and he found Reggie, Reginald Blender Hassett. Oh, no. there's, <laughs> there's not too many of them around. Uh, so he just kind of started, you know, ringing all the ones he could find. And pretty quickly, um, he rang Reggie Blennerhass, who was now Pro Vice Chancellor of Roehampton University, who was sitting in his office being all Pro Vice Chancellorish, and somebody rang up and said, Are you the Reggie Blennerhass from All That Dancing in Delights? Um, so that was the initial contact. He put him in touch, obviously, with Mike, who I think is very much the kind of the guardian of the flame and the custodian of all our records and so forth. Um, and it just grew from there. How much input did you have into the film and the script? Stephen spent a lot of time talking to us, researching us. He went down to South Wales and spoke to people there. And obviously he, he kind of looked at all the, the, the documentation, all our minutes and stuff, which is in the mm. um, National Labour Museum. Um, or National Museum of Labour History is gone, hasn't it? Um, and that process probably took about 12 months. And we met him on numerous occasions and we got to know him really well. And he came to social events with us mm. and um, built that kind of relationship of trust. And then he said, right, okay, now I'm going to sit down and write my script. Um, and I'm not going to show it to you, I'm not going to talk to you about it, I'm not going to um, have any input from you uh, until the script is finished and the film is mostly made. Um, because this is my film, it's not a documentary. Um, I really hope that you like it. Did but, you? you know, we did, yes. <laughs> all, almost all of us did. Uh, and with one perhaps exception. So, so, yeah, so from that point of view, there was no input into the the script itself, it, that, it, that is Stephen's work and quite rightly that it should be. Uh, and you know, he, he told us exactly what he was going to do at the start, that he was going to produce a mass market film that was somewhat in the tradition of Billy Elliot and mm. Brastoff and Maiden Dagenham and so mm. forth. And it was going to be aimed very much at brass market, uh, a mass market that would make, um, you know, th there would have to be compromises and mm. things that couldn't be referred to. Um, but that's what, that's what he wanted to do, that's what he felt the story deserved and I think it really delivered that. How accurate was the film? There are certainly things that are invented, um, there are characters, people who are invented, um, there are events that are dramatised, uh, there are events that are entirely made up. Um, but I think it's obviously based on a very large amount of real life and mm. stuff that really happened, those visits that where, where we went out to South Wales and the visits where, where miners and their wives came up to London and the miners coming on the march, that all happened. Uh, the fundraising happened, the um, Pits and Perverts benefit mm. happened, um, the story around about Jonathan and um, being you know one of the very early people diagnosed with HIV, mm. that's all based on reality, it's all true. Um, and the feel of the film is really, really true. I think it really conveys how much fun we had for a start. Um, and then the sets, the costumes, the characterization of the ma of, of the Ben and Big Prince and, and Havina as well. Mm. I mean, Imelda, you know, kind of. Mel Stone's brilliant. Yeah, yes. And, you know, and, 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 and um, I'm sorry, I've gone blank, I remember the, the actress who plays Sean. I mean, you know, the, they, they really mm. do. And um, the Gwen character, she's invented, but she is, you know, she, mm. there were people just like her, and lots of them. Um, so she may have been fictionalised, but she, she, you know, she, she is part of the reality of, 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 of South Wales mining communities. I mean, I've met lots of young gay men in 
South Wales at uh, various screenings and such like. And they, very often they say to me, I really love Ben. She's just like my auntie. <laughs> um, so it was really, really realistic in that way. The sets were realistic. Um, there's a scene set in the upstairs bedroom of Shanda Martin's house in Abercraft uh, with the two bunk beds. And when I first saw that, I thought, I slept in those bunk beds. <laughs> I mean, it was just so exact and so, so correct and so right. How many times have you seen the film? 107. <laughs> so I, I, I may have missed one or two out, I don't know. Um, and it's not just because I keep watching it, you know, I, I mean, it, I've been invited to watch the film, or to speak at the film. I mean, all of us have, lots of us have spoken at um, screenings and such like mm -hmm. all around the world. Um, I've probably been really, well, I've been exceptionally lucky and I've been able to combine some of the work, travel I do for work with screenings and I've been invited to speak at various places. So I've seen it in all sorts of places. Um, so that's why it's 107. It's not that I sit here quietly in my bedroom watching it night after night. The reaction to the film has been phenomenal. Yes. I saw the film in Sydney with an audience at a, a queer cinema festival. Everybody was in tears. Everybody was in laughter. Local groups within Australia, within the cities, within regional Australia, country towns, they come together, they show the film. It doesn't just have relevance here in the UK. Oh, absolutely all not. over the place. Why do you think it's got such relevance? I think it's different things in, in different places. Um, but certainly some of the storylines relate to everything. So as I was saying, that storyline about Gethin and Cliff, or the, the difference in those characters. I think that's something which lots of people from rural communities in in the States, or rural com communities in in Australia, or religious communities in South America, or whatever. You know, that, that's a attention that's been part of lots and lots of gay men's lives um, and, and probably of, of lesbians as well um, and I think that you know kind of that the fact it's a, sto a story about solidarity and activism and I think that lots of people who are involved and I think it, it's a it's a story about people who are under pressure and struggling finding common cause and I think that's again a kind of almost universal thing I think lots of people um, who were under pressure. So for instance, when it, it came out relatively soon after the Gezi uprising in, in Turkey, and we went to lots, or I, I particularly went to lots of screenings in, in Turkey. Um, and it had phenomenal reception in Turkey. And I think that's very much because it really resonated because the LGBT community in, in Istanbul in particular, and in Izmir and in Ankara, um, all saw that kind of real uh, similarity to what had happened at Gezi in particular, where um, the LGBT community who normally would have no real contact with trade unions and with other, and with the Kurdish mo movements, yes perhaps, but with other groups, Roma, Armenians, um, and trade unions in particular, particularly the blue-collar trade unions, um, and during Gezi that changed, so you had transsexuals um, and transsexual activists going into Gezi with lemon cologne <laughs> to hand out to people because it's a really mm -hmm. powerful um, agent against tear gas. So you had all these Chinese running around with bottles of cologne he helping people. And, you know, people who, have, mm -hmm. who would normally not have taken anything from them. They would, think, and that. All that kind of stuff started to build that relationship and, and I think the film mirrored some of that. So we had amazing responses in, in Turkey. Solidarity. Yeah, absolutely. Now there's a book out, Pride by Tim Tate. What's the book about? It's actually the recollections of stories of, I think, about 19 of us who were involved at the time. So. Tim spent a long time just talking to people um, and getting them to talk about the strike and what, how we got involved and what they remember of it and how it affected them and so forth. So it's mainly people who were involved in Lesbian's case what mine is here in London, but also some of the key players from South Wales. And obviously the film really dramatises a few people. Mm. Um, there are a lot, and, and you know, I was one of the lucky ones who my name was attached to a character because there was a, he, he wanted, 
Stephen I think wanted a Welsh character, he wanted somebody who'd moved from Wales and all the rest of it, so I fit into the bill. Um, but you know, that that was really just pretty random. Six or seven other people who were just as active in LGSM didn't get their names in the film. Um, so for some of them, I think it, it you know, uh, the uh, idea very much was to tell the true story now. It wasn't just me and Mike and Mark and Reggie and Ray and Jonathan and Steph. It was lots and lots of other people. Um, and some of those people have, have been able to get their story featured in the book. Um, and I think actually there's still quite a lot more stuff to to talk about and, and to write about and people to do stuff about. I mean, you know, we've seen, we've had plays and we've had um, kind of artworks created, uh, including a life-size statue of a, a life-size papier-mâché statue of a miner wearing a Pitts and Perverts t-shirt, which my mother made, which is now in the National Museum of Wales. Didn't the Sun and other tabloids adopt the phrase Pitts and Perverts? No, that was again a little bit of invention, by, a lot of invention by Mark. The Sun never ran a headline, Pitts and Perverts. Um, there were a few nasty stories, but not really very many. Mostly we were entirely ignored. Um, but that kind of Pitts and Perverts headline was something that Stephen invented. And, and the film doesn't, in fact, suggest it's the Sun. I think it's simply that anybody who knows anything about the Sun recognises that's the kind of thing they might well have done, um, but no, they didn't. When you go to all these events like premieres and book launches, do you feel like a star? No. I mean, I feel very privileged. Um, it's really striking just how, how nice people are. Um, so it's always enormous. I mean, you were there at the, the launch the other night. And, Brilliant. You know, it was just, everybody was so lovely. Mm. Um, and it all, it's always like that. You always have a really good time. And what I found and struck out the most to me about that book launch at Gaze the Word was the crowd of people, mainly younger. Yeah. I expected an older group of people. Do you think it's because of films like Pride that it is making younger people more aware of our history? I think so. I think there's, a, there's been a real upsurge in interest in our history over the last two years or so. And I think Pride did play a role in that. I think some of it would have happened anyway. I mean, I think there is you know, the, the 50th anniversary of the partial decriminalisation um, of male homosexuality that has triggered a, well, actually it's triggered quite a lot of, much more stuff than I was really expecting in terms of, um, you know, kind of polite society. Mm -hmm. So the BBC have done some really good stuff and the National Trust have done some really good stuff and the House of Commons are doing stuff. They have, you know, kind of a, 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 an exhibition about it and all that kind of stuff. And, various museums and, and, and the Tate Gallery, the Tate Modern have, 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 have that. So there was that all kind of official recognition, which I suppose was, was going to happen mm -hmm. anyway. But there's lots and lots of kind of more grassroots stuff. So mm -hmm. people like um, the Sexual Avengers and uh, Quitters of London, people, people around that kind of group of young activists um, mm -hmm. have really started exploring the history. And it's been great to mm -hmm. see, you know, real pioneers, because we were, we, fo we were following in the footsteps of people who are much braver than mm. us and who did stuff much, much earlier us than us in much more difficult circumstances. So all those early GLF people. So, you know, kind of, it's been great to go to events which mm. young activists have arranged to hear about the stories of people like Stuart Feather and um, some of those early uh, Nettie Pollard and people that, that who, who were involved in really, really early days. And there's still stuff going on. There's got a lot of stuff happening this year. Um, What's happened to Lesbian and Gay Support the Miners, LGSM? Is it still going? No, we kept going for about 12 months after the end of the strike because there was still a need to raise money. Um, and that's what we were about. We were about raising money, so we carried on raising money. Um, but, you know, kind of more than, more than 12 months after the strike, it was difficult to to justify standing on a bucket, <laughs> raising money for something that happened quite that mm. long ago. So we obviously, you know, ceased to, to meet and ceased to exist. We kept contacts um, with people in, in South Wales. A lot of it was actually just with them coming up to visit people mm. who were in, in hospital or who were dying or mm. whatever. I mean, I think one of the things that, because lots of, 
support groups had really warm relationships with their their mining communities and they twinned in the same way as did, we did and they um, visited and did reciprocal visiting and the rest of it. And very f little of that continued mm. much after the strike. For us, we had a really intense period in those few year, in those first few years after the end of the strike, um, where people were ill, people were dying, um, and our friends in South Wales kept touch, mm. came up to visit people in hospital, came to funerals. Um, were we part part of our support network at that mm. time, and I think that kind of cemented the relationship in some way and kept it go kept it going. And then, of course, you know. We, We've done things around various anniversaries, mm. the 10th anniversary, the 20th anniversary, and that amazing night, the 30th anniversary. Um, and they, they, you know, people came up on pride marches and things. Um, what does of course, Section 28 was, was immediately afterwards. And the NUM, I mean, it's, it's been really interesting over the last few years to learn more about what the NUM were doing, particularly mm. locally. I mean, they, um, we, you know, we all knew that they really worked hard at the Labour Party conference. They went around bullying other trade unions into to getting behind us mm -hmm. and um, were absolutely instrumental in getting that first uh, Labour and Gay Rights motion through a Labour Party conference. And they did some work at trade union co at TUC and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. What we hadn't heard about and didn't really hear about afterwards, things like, you know, NUM lodges, NUM branches, um, campaigning to get colliery housing opened up to same-sex couples. You know, they just quite went, went off and did that. Um, and they campaigned against Section 28 and all the rest of it. So I guess the, for, the contacts kept going for quite a long time after the strike on you know political level and so on and so forth. And, and then there was that really kind of emotional relationship um, built up when, when we were going through a really difficult time as a community. What does pride mean to you? I suppose I have quite a negative reaction to pride when I think of it in terms of the pride march and um, you know the, everything that was supposed to be a celebration of Stonewall and of, uh, of that act of resistance and uh, everything that was supposed to be about claiming our rights and claim all the rest of it. I mean, we've achieved an awful lot, but the pride events as it were, certainly in London, um, the commercialization, the takeover by um, wealthy business people and people from the kind of political elite and so forth, um, the complete lack of any politics, um, even things like charging people to march. I mean, it's just mm. it turns my stomach. Um, so I didn't go last year. Um, I think I was actually out of the country, but I wouldn't have gone anyway. Um, but then there's lots and lots of, I mean, it used to be Pride back 30 years ago. The Pride March was the London March. It, it is really encouraging that actually now we have stuff happening all over the country. Mm. Um, I know some of the LGSM lot are up in Doncaster today for Doncaster Pride and the, um, I'm sure they're going to have an amazing reception um, and they'll be selling the book and t-shirts and mm. all the rest of it. And probably I should try and go down to Cardiff Pride next week and I was at Brighton Pride a few weeks ago. Um, and there's lots and lots of little Pride marches that even, you know, at small places, I went up to Lancaster for their first ever Pride mm. March. Uh, a couple of months ago. So that sort of stuff is really encouraging. And some of those are, are, are political. And even on the kind of really depressing ones, I was really depressed when I turned up at Brighton March. I just thought, oh, this is just all commercial and horrible and all these ghastly people selling things and the co-op with their rainbow coloured hearse. And then I met up with the um, Lesbian Gay Support the Migrants group. And there was a few other kind of um, political groups mm -hmm. in, in the same part of the march and you know it just kind of made it all worthwhile um, and particularly actually what really cheered me up was the reception that Lesbian and Gay Support the Migrants got. I remember walking to, towards the back of the march and there were just thousands and thousands of people standing 
spectating, six deep mm -hmm. along either side, all along the, the seafront. And I was just thinking, you know, why are you standing there spectating? It's supposed to be a march, a demonstration. Join us and, you know, kind of get involved. Um, you're just here for the, the colour and the, the feathers and all the, the folder roll. Um, so I was feeling quite negative about it. And then as we came along, we got this amazing response to the Lesbian Gay Sport Migrants Contingents. And people were really, really pleased to see that they, you know, they were there and they were really encouraging and really um, supportive. And that really cheered me up as enormously. By the end of March, I was, I was so happy I even smiled at the policeman. <laughs> You've hinted at it with lesbian and gay support the migrants. What do we have left to fight for? Oh, there's lots of stuff. Um, I mean, there's a whole range of stuff around trans issues and, you know, the rights of people to, to define their their genders and to live their lives and, and to decide whether they want a gender and all the rest of it. And, and I think that's been a really remarkable change over the last 10 years that th those issues have really come to the forth. There's lots of stuff about young people, particularly in schools. Um, you know, I think the education system is still not supporting young LGBT mm -hmm. people at all. Um, there's still people getting beaten up on the streets, um, people getting queer bashed. Um, and then there's lots of ways in which austerity and um, public funding cuts impact mm -hmm. on young gay people. Things like libraries closing down. You know, I think libraries have always been somewhere where young people have been able to find out about stuff, to find out about their sexuality and to start to sort of explore those sorts of things. And if, if you take that away uh, and you don't have access to libraries, um, youth groups are closing down, um, aspect, uh, mental health facilities are, are closing down, lots of stuff that young LGBT people rely on disproportionately. Um, I think there's lots of stuff about, lots of things you need doing about um, LGBT elderly people. You know, a few years time I'm going to be retired and not that long probably I'll be in some kind of home or something but you know like kind of the, the facilities aren't there and then there's all the stuff around other people who are facing the kinds of discrimination and vilification and so so on that we used to face and, and on the whole now don't and I think migrants in particular um, I, I think one of the, the real legacies one of the things that I'm proudest about LGSM is the, the where it has inspired that younger generation of activists to get involved in stuff around migrants and refugees. Um. A couple of very quick questions before we end. Um, we've talked about minorities and even minorities within minorities. In the film Pride, there does seem to be a division between the women and the men. And some of the women go their own way. Was it accurate? Um, no, it wasn't. Um, obviously, the film really gives the impression that, you know, it was Steph and a bunch of gay men. Um, that, you know, she was the L in LGSM. Um, I mean, first of all, that's not true. There were far more women who were involved. There was obviously Lesbians Against Bit Closures. Um, and there were some women who only got involved in that. And then there were other women who were involved in both LGSM and Lesbians Against Bit Closures. And there were women who were only involved in LGSM. Um, there was in those days a much bigger, I think, w women scene. There were more kind of women-only venues. Mm -hmm. uh, lesbians, and get, uh, uh, lesbians get pit, pit closures. You know, ha had a real mission in terms of mm -hmm. collecting in, in women-only venues where we wouldn't have been able to go. Um, there were obviously tensions, as there always have been, where, you know, lesbians mm -hmm. get men are working together, um, or certainly in those days. Um, but I think, you know, it does manage to represent it. And I think the, the only thing actually that we were really disappointed about in, in terms of the film is that kind of um, cheap jibe about um, you know, the, the cheap portrayal of, of, of lesbians in, in, in that little scene in the, in the miners' welfare. Mm. Um, you know, kind of, it didn't really portray accurately. What is Geffen Roberts doing with his life today? 
Ooh, um, I'm involved in my trade union as I have been for many years. I'm involved in the Labour Party as I have hadn't been for many years, but since Jeremy Corbyn, um, I, I I've been reinvigorated and rejoined the Labour Party, and obviously, you know, doing everything I can to support. Um, this new move, mood in the Labour Party and, and support the Corbyn leadership. Um, I'm involved in Lesbians Gay Support the Migrants to some extent. I still do quite a lot of stuff around the film. Um, we get asked to speak at places on picket lines and pride marches and uh, student groups and the rest mm -hmm. of it. So it's still a, a kind of regular um, kind of request for for people to attend events and I do quite a lot of that. Um, I try to do stuff around supporting um, some of the groups that we've had contact with through the film. So, mm -hmm. so for instance, particularly in Turkey, I mean, I think, you know, the situation in Turkey goes from bad to worse. Um, the lesbian gay movements are under real, real pressure. Um, so where possible we do stuff to support the lesbian gay movement in Turkey and also kind of the Kurdish movement are quite, quite mm. involved in that to some extent. Um, then I work full time and um, I, I have a pub. Uh, that's in Wales, it. isn't it? In Wales, yes. That's the, um, I kind of divide my life between London and Wales. Kevin Roberts, thank you very much. Well, thank you. It's been a real pleasure talking to you.